We're gonna talk about gifts. Now, who doesn't like to talk about gifts? Who enjoys getting gifts? Absolutely. Who who wouldn't? I mean, gifts are one of those things that that are so important. I think as as kids, I look back and and, and growing up, that was something so important. We, it was it was exciting, and whether it be a birthday or whether it be Christmas or whatever, we enjoy those gifts. Well, the scripture today is going to talk about we receive special gifts, and I think this is so important. I think that God has gifted us all. And, and what we need to understand is that, that we have that in our possession, but we're to use it for his glory. And I think a lot of times, some of us may have some gifts and they're, they're sitting on the shelf and they've collected dust. Anybody ever do that? Yeah. And we need to pull that thing out. And, and as the apostle Paul would tell Timothy, we need to fan it into flame. So let's dive into our scripture today. We're in Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. However... He has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens. So that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the teachers, or the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Every member of the body of Christ is a gifted member, okay? Every member of the body of Christ is a gifted member. We're going to talk a little bit about the apostles and the prophets and the pastors and the teachers, and we're going to, we're going to talk, but we're going to also add to that, and we're not going to just stop with that concise list. We're going to add everyone in that as we look through these scriptures. There's so much here. I need a lot. I need, I need more than 40 minutes, okay? So we may stop here and pick up with this next week. No one is neglected from that. Remember that. I like in the New King James, or excuse me, yeah, the New King James Version. It says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ measured that gift. I, I, I like that word measure. If we look at that word measure, it, is, it, it essentially is, is given according to the will of Christ. He understands our needs and abilities. Do you understand that? Our God understands us. We're not coming to God with, a, with, a, with, with, with so much that he doesn't understand. We're coming to God and he understands us. He says, listen, I'm going to gift you. I'm going to take care of every one of your needs. I'm going to place you exactly where I want in my kingdom. But I want you to deliver. You understand that? We, we, God is gifting us with a gift. He says, now I want you to deliver. We're going to see the importance of that in the body of Christ. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. I want to look at those first two that he talks about in this text. And we're going to add some others from another text. But I want to look at those first two. And those words were apostles and prophets. The apostles and prophets are so important. Okay. As we look at those. 
They're so important because you and I today have their words. And you know what it's called? The New Testament. The Bible. Okay, And we're going to get into that in a second. But I want you to look at Jesus in his prayer for unity in the garden. And he begins to pray for these disciples, apostles and prophets. And then he prays for us. And I want you to look at this prayer. And you're going to see where it ties totally into Ephesians 4, talking about the unity of the body of Christ. Okay? Let's go with that. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from me. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me, and I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Now, he's praying for his disciples here, okay? About ready to leave them. It says, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. That was Judas Iscariot. It says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in this world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent them, as you send me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus is speaking completely about his apostles here. And those disciples that walked with him, okay? And now his prayer is going to turn to you and I. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their, the apostles' message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You look at that scripture long before the, uh, the apostle Paul uh, comes to this spot of, of the apostles and prophets. Listen, Jesus spoke about this, okay? They will, they will unify the body of Christ. Who is that? The apostles and the prophets. What are they going to speak? The message about Jesus, okay? Remember that. You and I sit here today. Is Jesus Christ here with us? Is Jesus Christ? He's here with us through his words of the New Testament. He sits at the right hand of God. He's placed within you and I, the Holy Spirit. And he says, here is the word of God. And it should come alive every day to us. That's the apostles and the prophets' teachings, okay? Their teaching office was the first century, all right? Their teaching office was the first century. But their words are still alive today. Have you ever heard that scripture? The word is active. The word is alive. Have you read that in Hebrews? That's what that means. The apostles and the prophets are still teaching today the, the message of Christ through the word of God that you and I hold and through his spirit that he placed within us. Okay? So let's talk first about those apostles. What is an apostle? If, if I got up today and... and and said to you, I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can haul me out back and stone me. Okay? That's not correct. There were but a few apostles. We read about them in the New Testament. They were handpicked by Christ, weren't they? We saw them. They were handpicked by Christ. Now look closely to what a definition of an apostle is. 
It says it was a delegate specifically, an ambassador of the gospel, officially, a, a commissioner of Christ. And they said they had miraculous powers. I don't have those. Okay. <laughs> that he sent. Okay. Now look closely at the apostle Paul when he calls himself an apostle and he says, look at me, I'm an apostle. Here's how you know that I'm an apostle. I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle. Paul was talking in this text about false apostles. Okay. He says, I'm a true apostle. And how would we even know that? He says, there are signs, wonders, and miracles that are produced by the Holy Spirit through me. Okay. That was an apostle. The apostles were so important to the church. When you pick up the Bible and you start reading. Okay. And you start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts, Romans, all those. What are those writings? What do you read? Well, when you read the gospel accounts, you're reading the story about Jesus, aren't you? You know who that was penned by? Prophets. Apostles. Those people were eyewitnesses, a lot of them, of Jesus Christ. And they penned that down for you and I today. As we go ahead and we read it, and it comes alive to us. The church was devoted. Listen closely. The church was devoted to apostolic teaching. That was so important. That's what they devoted themselves to. They devoted themselves to apostolic teaching because those apostles were teaching about who? Jesus. That's who they were teaching about. Okay? It says they devoted themselves to apostolic or apostles teaching. That was the church. Fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Okay? That's what we're doing today. We are devoted to apostolic teaching through the word of God. Okay, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. That was what an apostle was. What was a prophet? Okay, again, if I would say today, I'm a prophet. That's not true. Those prophets were first century prophets. Okay, they were spoken to by the Holy Spirit. Prophets appeared at the apostolic age among Christians. Their message, their message was about Christ. It was given by God and carried them along as they spoke. Sometimes I'll hear this. Oh, can we really believe the Bible? It's just a bunch of men that penned it. And I always go, haven't you read 2 Peter? Now take a look quickly at 2 Peter with me. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy, okay, no prophet spoke on his own is what that's saying. No prophecy of scripture came about by a prophet's own interpretation of things, okay? For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? It's God's word. Exactly. You know what that means? We're picking up the Bible. We're going, Matthew wrote it. But really what we're saying is God wrote it. Matthew penned it. All right. That's what we're saying. They could not err. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The apostles and prophets were so very important because you and I today can trust that we pick up and we hold the inspired word of God. And with that word, it brings us into unity as we reach out and touch the world with Christ. That's a beautiful thing. That's how I trust in the Bible. We have the apostles and prophets speaking to us today. It's called the New Testament. Okay? We can pick that up. And then he talks about the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. Well, I'm going to make it real clear. I'd be the evangelists, okay? And I don't think he's talking about the, 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 the evangelists that, that were spoken to by God directly. He's just talking about those evangelists like Timothy. Okay. You, I would be an evangelist. Say, you evangelists did. Spread the good news. Okay. And, and, and to some people, it's not good news. But that's what the Bible calls it, right? The good news as we learn today in class is the gospel, isn't it, kids? That's, that's what it is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It is a message that every evangelist should bring at all times, okay? You ever notice that? Sometimes evangelists start speaking about a lot of other things other than the real word of God. And you wonder about that. Sometimes, some preachers can get up and speak a long time and on one verse of the Bible. And I'm always like, boy, I think the Bible could shed a lot of light on what we say, not on what 
God said, okay? Stick to the word of God. It's amazing. It is the true word of God. Okay, so the evangelists. Timothy. Now look closely. As you go into the book of Timothy, you'll see he was an evangelist. All right? Paul caressing him. He brought him in. He said, this is, he's going to be an evangelist. Here's what an evangelist is going to do. Remember, we're talking about Ephesians. The unity of the body, the apostolic teaching, the prophecy. That's the Bible we have today. And now we have the evangelist. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. Who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Paul's charge in Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instructions. I'm still working on that with great patience, by the way. For the time will come when people will, now look closely, not put up with sound doctrine. Have you ever, you, you think about that today. People will not put up with sound doctrine. Pretty fit. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Now, I read that and I thought, hmm, can we do that as preachers and evangelists? Can we speak to the multitude and what they want to hear instead of what God wants them to hear? Sometimes a message is brought and it's brought with force and it very much rebukes us and it very much chastises us. But what we've got to understand is it's chastising us, it's rebuking us because we're doing something wrong that doesn't line up with the word. Okay. When we look at Hebrews, he'll tell us that God disciplines his children. We need to understand that. As parents, we discipline our children. We gave the old, this is going to hurt me worse than this is going to hurt you. You ever do that as a parent? That's ridiculous. Okay, but we do that. We use that. But God is saying to us is, I discipline you, and it hurts me as much as it hurts you. He wants to change us. He wants to conform us to the likeness of the Son. Okay? That's what an evangelist does. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Now, we've moved from evangelist to pastor. Now, I realize that word pastor is confused big time today. We use the word pastor for a preacher. And that word is not synonymous. Okay. A pastor is not an evangelist. Now, what I'm trying to say is pastors are the leaders. When, when you come in here and you look around, you're going to see three pastors of this church. Okay. You're going to see Mike Weber, Mike Cocker, and Kevin Zimmerman. They're the pastors. They're the elders of this church. In other words, if you have complaints, don't tell me. Tell them, okay? That's what that means. If there's something wrong, don't go to the evangelist. Go to the pastor, okay? They're the ones leading. And they were very important for the unification of the group, okay? Let me tell you. We ran without elders for a long time. We were just, just moments away from imploding, weren't we? It just That's the way it works. Elders are strong Christians that are built to lead the body of Christ, all right? Synonymous with pastor, all right? To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in glory to be revealed. Be shepherds. This is what he's telling the elders, the pastors. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. God has called elders and he's holding them responsible. He's holding them responsible for this body. If things aren't working well with this body, it's kind of like Larry, a commissioner. When the roads aren't good, we're going to go lying to you. When, 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 church, when, when things aren't going well in church, people go to the elder. Now, I'd say that again. Don't go to the evangelist. Go to the elder. All right? Very important. Pastors are so important. It says, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. This is what they did. They knew the importance of the body of Christ. They wanted to preserve it from the false teachers coming in. They knew the elders were sound in doctrine. They knew that they could keep this group unified together, that they would stick with true teachings. Okay? Now look, it says, 
An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it was brought, as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others. Now look closely. How's he going to encourage others? By sound doctrine. And refute those who oppose it. Oppose what? Sound doctrine. Let me go back to the apostles and the prophets. You and I have the word of God today, right? New Testament. We have the teaching of the apostles and prophets. What are the elders to do? Now the evangelists can get up here. And what you want out of the evangelists, you want a loud mouth. Okay? You got it. All right? You want someone preaching the word of God. You want someone teaching the word of God. But here's what the elders do. They make sure to have that word and they make sure to protect it. Now, they, here's what happens. Listen, it is very important to notice. The elder is watching. They're making sure that, that there's nothing false coming in here. They're making sure that, that they're protecting the sheep. All right? And you know what you are? A sheep. And sometimes sheep aren't very smart. And it's easy to follow false teachers. And so it's very important, and we, have, we are very blessed to have three elders that are very strong in the Word of God, that if someone comes in here and brings some foreign teaching, something that is not right, they're able to say, that's not right. We're going to stick to truth. It's a beautiful thing to have the gospel that saves people in our hands. But let me tell you what, as we see it today in America, it can be perverted. Amen? Quickly. And you may think, oh, that's, we, we, we don't do that. It can happen so quickly and so innocently. So important to have leaders in the body to stay unified. If it is teaching, let them teach. This is one of the gifts of Romans. We'll get into that here in a second. If it is teaching, let them teach. He's, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Roman church. He's saying, listen, we're all gifted. And we'll deal with that in a second. There's teachers there. I look out here. I see a lot of teachers. Okay. We are blessed in this body to have many teachers. What is a teacher? A teacher is able to, to get up and, to, and, and, and they understand they have a good grip on the word of God and they're able to speak it out. And they're able to share that with the, with the members. They're able to encourage them. They're able to say, hey, look at this. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect and know everything, but it just means you've got an excitement within you when you open up God's word and you want to share that. Essentially what that is, is being a servant of what God's given you. Now you got to be careful because a teacher is going to be judged a little differently, right? James says it this way, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. God is holding us accountable for teaching. You know God holds us accountable as parents, doesn't he? Think about that for a second. I was thinking of... Uh, this gal, and, and, and I mean, it just seems that everything she touches comes up bad. And I was thinking for a second, I thought of her parents and her grandparents, and there's not a lot there. And then I was thinking about how that sin follows from generation to generation to generation. You ever notice that? Have you ever noticed that? It's so important. Let me tell you what. As parents, and I'm, I'm talking to all parents, and let's get, guess what? I'm still not done parenting, okay? We still parent, all right? As parents, we need to be teaching our children about Jesus daily, and God is holding you accountable. Understand that. It is so important. Don't you go and walk in and say, well, the church has let us down because they haven't taught our children. That's not true. You have the ability to teach your children. Remember Timothy? Does anyone want to take a shot at who taught Timothy? Mother and grandma. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You can be just a mother with the littlest children. And you remember Deuteronomy? And you go back to Deuteronomy. It says, you know what? Tie it to these children. Teach those children daily. You better teach about Jesus. Because guess what? The hand that's rocking that cradle is important. Because there is a world out there that is wanting that children or those children to leave their home so they can teach them something that's not correct. All right. 
Don't, tend, don't send your child to a university without knowing Jesus because let me tell you, the university won't teach them about Jesus. Do you agree? There's just not a load of godly believers that are teaching those universities. Okay? You better teach them. So important. Okay, now I can get off that box for a second, okay? Uh, I, had, I still have a lot of time. Okay, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Now look closely. For equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Now, I, we read all this. I had to go into all this, but now we're going to get to the good stuff because what he's saying is we, I am equipping the body of Christ for something. Now, he says this. He says it's for the work of the ministry. Now, the word ministry is the same word that we use for servant or for even a deacon, okay? It's, it's that same word, ministry. We are in a ministry. We are being equipped as believers for a ministry. You were not just a Christian called out by God to set on your hands and do nothing. My irritation as a parent would it be walking in from outside and seeing my kids be couch potatoes. Does that take any parent off ever? Drives me crazy. Absolutely nuts. In fact, I can almost lose control when I saw that. You know, as a parent. I'm like, get out of the house. And go smell some of God's creation. <laughs> okay? God's looking at us the same way. He said, I created you. I designed you. I've given you special gifts. And now here's what I want you to do. Be a servant. Use that gift. Okay? It says that these apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, they're all going to help you grow in your work. Okay? Let's keep going. Work in the ministry and for edifying the body of Christ till all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what God's calling us to do. He's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to become a servant. Now listen, his apostles that walked with him didn't always get this. If you go back to Mark 9, 33 through 35, it says, then he came to Capernaum, it says, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Remember what that was? Who's the greatest? All right. It says, but they kept silent. For on the road, they had dis <laughs> disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all. And look closely and assess and servant of all. God hasn't called us to be the greatest. He hasn't called us to, to, to a job that we have no understanding of. Okay? I, I, I sometimes have to ask my brother that. What is your job? What is your job? Do you really have one? You know, and we, and we talk about this. Listen, God didn't give us a job and say, you're just going to sit at home and do nothing. He gave us a job and it's in the body of Christ. And he says, now I want you to go out and serve. And it's not that you can be the greatest, but it's that you, so you can go serve, okay? Anyone who wants to serve must follow me because my servants must be where I am. So what he's saying is servants follow Jesus. And the Father, Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now listen closely. That's the purpose of your gift, all right? I want you to just think about that for a second. That's the purpose of your gift. The purpose of your gift is to serve and to equip now look closely and to edify that's our job equip edify some people are there to equip others are there to edify all right now i want to go back to that romans chapter 12 i don't want to leave those gifts out that's so important we heard those gifts in ephesians 4 i want you to look at the gifts that paul calls out in the roman church for everyone he says in his grace god has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If it's teaching, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, 
be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend. I, I love that word. Don't just pretend. In other words, don't just go through the motions to love others. He says, really love. Don't go through the motions. Really do it. He says, hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with a genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Okay? Rather, in our confident hope, re rejoice in confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. It says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Let me tell you, Paul unloads right here. If you're, if you're sitting here as, as a member of the Roman church, and we are, okay, we're part of that body, you've got to say, where do I fit? What do I need to do? I'm called by God to do something. What am I doing? Some of us are, are have a plethora of gifts. It's a wonderful thing. Some of us have been gifted in life. Some of us maybe one or two, but that's okay. God gave them to you. Now we go out and we use them. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. So what? Now I want you to look at this closely. We miss it. Some of us, let me just put it this way. Some of us are on a moral patrol, okay? Drives me crazy. Anybody know anybody who's ever on a moral patrol? You know, where's the encouragement? Now, sometimes we do have to call out sin, sin. I get that. But, man, well, you and I, you and I have a spiritual gift. It is given to us and to each of us so that we can what? Help each other. Help each other. That's simple. You and I are here to help each other. That's what we want to do. We want to grow us to maturity. All right? Sometimes we got to fan those gifts. Sometimes we got to help fan the neighbor's gift, help them along. Listen, I can see that you're gifted. I can see that you can bring great unity to this body. I can see you can be a great servant of the Lord. Here's your gift. Let me help you with that. Listen, older believers need to help younger believers. That was God's design. Okay? Otherwise, there'll be no younger believers. Remember that. A generation away from apostasy. That's so true. All right. This is why I remind you to fan the flames, the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. That was Paul speaking to Timothy. Timothy was a great preacher. But even Paul said, man, the fanning into flames is important. It's so important. How, how can a, a, an older member help a younger member fan into flames the gift that's within him? Invest time. Period. Invest time. Any of you guys have time? You know what? We've got 24 hours, don't we? 24 hours in a day. We got it. Each of you got it. Some, some of us will just use it up. And in the end, in the end, we'll go, what did we really get done? You ever had one of those days you got nothing done and you used up 24 hours? Mm -hmm. God says, I've called you. I've given you the same amount of time. Here's what I want you. I want you to use it. And I wanted you to use it for my glory. Okay? There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works, now look closely, in different ways. But it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Different. We're all so different, but God is working in the lives of each of us. It says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. And it says, and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be. Now look closely. The goal is to be mature in the Lord, measuring up the full and complete standard of Christ. What God is saying is we must mature. Okay? It is so important. You know, we, we, we're having little baby calves right now. So cute. In one year, we expect that little baby calf to no longer be a little baby calf, do we? We expect it to grow up. We expect it to mature. Someday we expect to eat it. Okay? Doesn't know that yet. Don't tell them. Listen, that's what we're doing. We're maturing as, as a body of believers. That's what we're doing. We're maturing each other up. We got to mature. Now listen, I'm going to close with this. You're going to get out five minutes early. We must 
we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you are no longer, you no longer, you no longer try to understand. Just talk to a body of believers. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. Now look closely what he says. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. All right? What that scripture is saying is every one of us have got to mature into using the gift that God has given you. If you've been a believer for 20 years and you're still sitting there not realizing your gift, you may still be sucking teat. Okay. Seriously. You got to look at yourself. You got to say, where have I moved on? Have I moved on from the milk, the very beginning gospel account where I'm saying to say, God, what do I need to do in your kingdom? We need to be getting up every morning and saying, God, what can I do for your kingdom? I may only be a believer for 10 days, but what can I do for your kingdom? Do you know those elders were picked out of a group that wasn't Christians very long? Do you know that? You realize that? They hadn't gone 20 years. Well, I'll be an elder in 30 years. No. Some of them maybe only had three years, four years. And so here's the thing. I think as we look at this, as we look to unify ourselves, what we got to say is, am I doing everything I can for Jesus? What gift inside of me? Am I using and what gift am I not using? And then allow the body of Christ to grow us into his likeness. Let's go to him in prayer. God, we are so thankful for your teaching. We're so thankful for your scriptures. God, there is, there's nothing else in this world that can change our lives like your Bible, like your Holy Spirit. God, I'm so glad that, that every single believer here has that Holy Spirit. And I know that sometimes we live this life and, and we get so caught up in, in our world and our work and, and what we need that we literally get confused and we have lack of focus. God, help us focus in on the most important thing. That is teaching Jesus not only to a world, but God, to our children because we understand we're one generation from apostasy. Help us to cling to the word of God in everything we do. We pray this in Jesus' name.